OTAN, Outreach and Technical Assistance Network. All right, welcome everyone. Thank you for joining me for this presentation on using coaching cycles to create data visualizations for decision making. So really what we're gonna be talking about today is how you can take interactions from teachers that you're working with in terms of like observations, coaching, et cetera, professional learning. And how can we take that data and put it into really nice visuals so that you and stakeholders can make decisions for the betterment of your teachers, students, et cetera. So that's the goal of today's presentation. A little bit about me. I work for Education and Career Network in North San Diego County. I do all the tech integration. So I work as a coach, do all the professional learning, work with about 100, 510, 120 teachers. Um, and I at the consortium level, along with a number of our other shared positions. Um, so it's fun working in a lot of different schools. All the ESL teams, CPE, ASC, um, ABE, all the programs I work with. And so I'm also a professor at San Diego State University in a dual language English language learner program, as well as at Concordia University Irvine, where I work with doctoral students. And um, so really what I'm going to be talking a lot about today is just stuff that we do every single day in our consortium to all of our schools that are partners. And um, I give you a sheet. There's a information there where you can take notes as well as a um, QR code that can take you to my flow page that has everything about me. And then I'm going to, for those actually that are watching this, I'm going to give them the link to this presentation real quick and putting it in the chat. Did this earlier. There we go. Perfect. Slideshow is now in the chat. Thank you. All right. So, why instructional coaching? So, it's funny in California in K 12, it's been utilized. But in a lot of other parts of the United States, instructional coaching is used quite often. In California, and especially adult ed, I think it's truly really in its infancy. Um, it's different in terms of a lot of the instructional leadership is based on evaluation versus just building the capacity of our teachers. And investing in instructional coaching, there's a ton of research behind it and how there's a large effect size to impact student learning and outcomes as well as teachers' overall efficacy in their practice. So I want to outline a number of studies real quickly, just describing the effect of instructional coaching um, that's non-evaluative. It is for um, really impacting student outcomes and, and teachers' overall um, you know, capacity to teach better. And we notice in this study right here, by Kraft and Blazer, um, where we look at the effect of coaching. It's a 0.49 effect size, which is actually quite large. When we look at, if you know John Hattie's work and his effect sizes, structural coaching um, with this effect size is actually quite high. And we can really um, bridge a gap between novice and veteran teachers by that instructional coaching. And, um, really see over time here with the achievement that student uh, coaching programs have produced larger improvements in teacher practice and show larger effects on student achievement. And this is done in the K-12 environment, but um, the results um, are being really picked up by a lot of schools throughout the country, especially in the Eastern Coast and uh, Midwest, where they, for example, a school site may have two or three instructional coaches along with their staff. Um, and districts may have about 10 to 15 that they're working with teachers constantly. Um, and what it says over here on the far right, larger programs are less effective. So for example, 
if you have a coach covering more than 100 teachers, a single coach, then you're not going to have that much effect in business, right? You're going to have a coach cover um, a smaller number of teachers because that's where they can make that impact, right? Um, and you'll see why in a minute when we talk about coaching cycles and what goes into that. So um, just wanted to share um, this study here. Um, you can check it out if you want, as well as three other major studies regarding instructional coaching and its impact on teaching and learning. Um, it's truly, um, I think, really emerging as a really powerful way to build capacity, but also, like I said, build teacher effects, uh, advocacy as well as ensure that they don't burn out, right? So what we did in our consortium is we started with um, our goals in mind. So. In our three-year plan, we discuss like the need for professional development. Um, and really we get into the nuts and bolts of it right here, staff participation and training and coaching related to diversity, equity, inclusion, integration of technology and classroom and instructional strategies are promoted. So that's kind of where it comes from. And um, also regular reuse and access professional development website. Um, serve as a central location for our opportunities for professional learning. And we want really want to focus really specifically on students who engage in active learning within our class offerings, right? So we wrote this within our three-year plan, and that's the basis for what we're doing. And we found a measure for wanting to measure like technology integration as well as active learning within our classrooms. So we ultimately decided to use a technology integration matrix, also known as the TIM, and that's through the University of Florida, uh, South Florida, I believe, or Central Florida. Um, and it's a really cool matrix where um, you can see, um, let me just pull this up here. Let me see where I can pull up really, I wanna see, show you guys a big image of it. There it is. So, what this does is it measures technology integration um, through four, I mean, five different steps from entry level all the way up to transformational. And we start off with active, collaborative, constructive, authentic, and goal directed. And what we do here is we're measuring what exactly are we seeing in classrooms based on this, right? We go into classrooms and observe and provide like uh, uh, feedback as well as say like, hey, we think that this teacher is adopting Google Slides at a conventional level that's procedural that's used in their classroom. And what's cool is, is that we can sit down with the teacher, we can sit down with some leadership team and talk about like, what does this all mean? Um, and I can show examples of what this looks like in classroom environments, right? So. We're utilizing a rubric that is something that we can measure what we're seeing with, but also show examples of what that is, right? And we can provide what that coaching looks like. So that's just a little bit of our rubric. So I have it uh, all here. So when we when I came into this position two years ago, it really was to build relationships with teachers because a lot of teachers, when you don't know what instructional coaching is embedded within their job, they think it's like someone's coming in to evaluate me. Like, hey, it's coming in to really judge what I'm doing versus, hey, this is my partner here. I'm going to help them uh, work on something that they may want to learn as well as what we want them to learn, right? So building relationships with them is key and developing a culture where this is the norm, right? Within our consortium. So that took me about, about six, six to nine months to do um, when I was setting this all up. So really this is how we created this um, culture of instructional coaching is, is that explain the positives, not evaluative, it's collaborative, we're learning together, the walking coach. So I go to all of our classes throughout the week. I go to various school sites. I try and drop in as many classes as possible. Five to 10 minute drop-bys provide a little bit of feedback. 
that it's an email sent to them as well as I'm tagging various things of what they're doing. And they can see that in the email that I send them. And then that goes to our database, right? And then what that does is ultimately leads to coaching sessions because I get to see them more and they know what I'm doing. And we talk a little bit about what they're doing in the classroom. Sometimes we have follow-ups after I come in or sometimes they want to schedule a meeting with me do a one-on-one -on -one session when I come into their classroom or through a Zoom session, right? So these are some things that kind of help build it. And then consistent communication. We have a newsletter that goes out for um, all instructional practices and tech integration. Um, have open line of communication through just texting me and email. Um, we have asynchronous professional learning on our ETCN EdTech website where we have videos, slides, thousands of templates that's all there in one location that they can access everything that we're working on, as well as any sort of training that we've had. So um, then we also offer the synchronous professional learning where we have series like, for example, right now we're working on the 2023 spring active learning um, UDL and differentiation series where it's a four part series where we provide a synchronous consortium wide offering that is recorded. And then the teachers get paid to come and then they get paid to do the tasks in the class. So for example, they need to build it out and they need to have students, you know, interact with it. And then I check to make sure that they're doing it. And then they get those additional hours. So the payment piece for that uh, synchronous learning has been really effective. Um, and then we also had to discuss like, what does this all mean for, you know, us as a consortium? So I had to really talk to stakeholders about like why we're doing this, starting with the research and then collecting the data to drive exactly what we're doing in these trainings based on what I'm seeing. And then aligning it with, you know, goals for um, our coaching and professional learning, right? So in those were the goals that we've come up with. So it's, it's developing that ongoing culture where this exists. And then talking about the implementation of coaching cycle. So a coaching cycle is essentially you're working with a teacher throughout the school year or a designated period of time. So you first identify what they're doing and then you and the teacher work together for so that they can learn and move the needle in that area. What we're doing is evaluating them in the coaching piece with the TIM, the matrix, and then we're looking at examples of them improving, and then we look back and identify it. So you'll see what that looks like in a minute. And that's by Jim Knight, and this is, I've utilized Jim Knight's framework for this. So this is just what I just mentioned. So now this is like the collecting the data piece and showing what this looks like and then the visualization. So then we can make decisions um, based on what we see. So, um, for example, I can type in all my different types of observation types, which lead to what am I working on with this? What, what am I working on with the teacher? Is it like a, just a strictly a coaching session? Is it just normal tech support? Are we working on our Canvas course? Does it lead into a professional development session? Uh, Co-teaching and planning. So that leads into opportunities where I go and teach them something together in a class with them. And then I do tags. So what do I see that's happening in their class when I come in? And I tag it here and we have tags. And it can be even more sophisticated. I've kind of changed up the sophistication of the tags based on each strategy and tool. So I can see how many times this is happening and what we're working on in these trends, right? And I can see how much time I'm engaging with educators and I can break that down per hour and I can show you what that looks like in a second. So when you say, when you say tagging? Yeah, it, so it's just like creating a tag. So like, for example, I'll liken it to, say you're writing an email to someone and you can create like a, a tag is essentially just like what that conversation could be about. Mm -hmm. So in the system that we utilize is that we're tagging what these things are about or like, what are we observing? What are we coaching about? Mm -hmm. So that we can keep track of those data points. 
that's what tagging is. Okay. That's what it is. And I'll show you. Um, Do the trending tags sit within the interaction types? So yes. maybe like a subset of the interaction yeah. type, and then the interaction types are within that tag. Yes. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So, and then we can look at kind of like how we're supporting various buildings based on the school. When are we doing it? How much time are we investing into them? So we can get, you know, making sure that based on their teacher population that we're, you know, trying to distribute my time as much as possible, right? And then who am I doing it the most with? Um, and across here, this is mostly just, some of these are designated CTE. So generally for us, um, I'd say about 60, 30, 60% uh, ESL, 30% CTE, and then 10% everything else. And then um, we can see throughout the year when the most interactions are occurring throughout the week based on category. Um, and this is what the coaching cycles look like. So say we want the teacher to work on active uh, learning and it's based on the Tim matrix because it's out of five. And this, for example, is the beginning rating. Then say after a six to eight week process, oops, that they have, that they've improved based on, um, you know, observation, feedback, number of times that we put in our coaching cycle, that they move the needle up. Same thing if the teacher needs to work on assessment or if they need to work on Canvas, you think Canvas is a tool, right? And then we can see across the board, I've done about 50 cycles. And then I can determine which educators are making growth, which are making considerable growth. So my goal is each year to focus on give or take about 50 teachers. I can't, I can't invest so much time into everyone, but if I can focus on 50, like that I'm doing a significant amount of work with, then I know that we're really going to move the needle with those people, and especially the ones that are more enthusiastic than um, maybe the bottom 10, 20%, which would be the laggards. But the goal is, is that if you can make the considerable growth with the adopters, hopefully that more trickles down to the laggards, right? How would you um, define considerable growth? So considerable growth is, for example, if they move up one. So if they move up okay. one whole scale piece of the rubric, right? So if they started a one and they moved to a two, that would be considered considerable growth. Um, 0.5 would be just normal growth. And then we can see across the board here, I took out names for this, but say this is the Koji's name. You can see, like, say this, this person's focus is on Canvas. We can see their initial rating was one. Now they're over to two. Their growth is one. This person was one. They were now at three. They moved up to two, right? And we can see this within the database. And we're using it based on the rubric here, right? Because it's a five point rubric. And um, this is kind of just the, the, you know, my philosophy is, is that the more informal feedback that you're giving, the more that leads into coaching sessions, the more that leads into course design, the more that leads into more professional learning. So the more, and um, there's actually a psychological, um, a lot of research really in this, the more um, constant access or more people see you, the more likely they're wanting to do something with you, right? So visibility, it's, I think it's called, a, it's a visibility factor. So ultimately that's my philosophy with the teachers that we have in our consortium. And this is kind of um, where I do the data collection piece. So within connecthub.io, or you can do this on a Google form. And this is the person's name at the very top. I type in their name and it put have it already in our database. And then I have like, what's my interaction type? 
what's going on, what's the narrative piece, then I start adding tag based on like what we're doing or what it is, right? And then when I'm done, if it's um, an observation and formal feedback, I send them an email that has exactly what I've written up. And it goes right to their email. And then that goes into our database. Can I think I put the picture? Yep. And what we've done recently with uh, one school in our consortia, they want to do more, like full on learning walks. So they've adopted this. The administrators have adopted the tool and what I'm doing. So they're doing constant learning walks with this and collecting the data on for their site level. And then they're using that to, you know, monitor their progress and make the decisions based on where their teachers are at instructionally. Um, so this is how we, the, how we collect data. And then the power of these visualizations is like, hey, we know what we're doing. We know we're tagging. We know what the trends are. We know where these teachers are at based on where they're at on the rating scale and where we need to grow. And then we can also look at other data. So for example, like CASA's testing or high school testing. Can we maybe see if there's a correlation between the work that we're doing and those outcomes, right? So that's kind of why this is really important because we're collecting at this other data set that we can use to then compare to see if it's moving the needle with our students. And you haven't done that yet? Are you doing that? We are doing that. Yeah. I would suspect though, but it'd be interesting to see. I we need it more longitudinally. So I need to see like more over like the next couple of years. Okay. Like what can I see like after like three or four years of this? And then see like if over the course of you know, a couple of years, like, is there that huge measurable problem? But the studies say in K-12 that there is an opportunity for considerable growth, right? So, yeah, I and mean, that's the thing we all got that in our admin training. We get that. Do you get to go to your district-wide tra administrator trainings that have nothing to do with adult ed? No, we never get to go. So we get, so the benefit is we get to hear some of this stuff. And um, we do the learning walks. But this this can, this makes it go for the teachers, or at least makes it easier to understand. And the, so that tagging is when you're actually doing observation, writing everything, and while you're writing, you tag. This you're is tagging, it's... yeah. You're tagging okay. everything, and you can determine like so. Say you have a rubric that you want to use. Maybe it's not the PIM. It can be DOK. It can be test. It can be really whatever. You can put those into the system, and then use those tags. Based on what your goals are. Gotcha. Yeah. And you guys go through training. So those that are doing the walk, well, you're doing you're the expert. You're doing the walkthroughs. Do you do other schools use other staff? It's like a someone that's trusted, they know. Obviously so not in the industry. Only or. so only one school currently is doing like the full on learning walks. Mm -hmm. I'm doing it for the consortia. Okay. And I don't share like for example, like personal names. Mm -hmm. I just share like what the okay. performance okay. looks like gotcha. across you know that school. And if they want, I can share it with them. Okay. But I try to keep it, you know, there's a fine line you don't want to cross mm -hmm. at times. So you have to mm -hmm. navigate that in that in, in the position that I'm in at least, right? So this is like year one, right? This was year one. I wasn't doing coping cycles, but then I moved to year two with coping cycles. So now, um, you know, we can see year to year progress. So that's a really cool piece of this. And these are some of the tools that you can use. I use Connect Hub, but I know you can use it on Google Forms and Sheets. Connect Hub's only like ten dollars a month, um, so we've invested. And um, but you can set up the same thing with Google Forms. Can I ask why Connect Hub? Connect Hub is just, I think, if we're looking at coaching platforms, it creates all this data visualization without you having to do it on, um, for example, if I fill it out in Google Form, then I go to Sheets, and then I would have to create the visualizations on right. Sheets. This creates it for you. So yeah. that's... Okay. And it's $10 a month for how many... Uh, so, for example, it's ten dollars per user. Oh, okay. So if you're with fifty teachers, it's five hundred. No, no, no. So oh. if it's just me, it's one hundred twenty dollars, and it's just based on the 
the, the coaches, the number of coaches you have. So if it's an administrator, that's you know 120 bucks. If it's another coach, it's 120 bucks. Or if it's another admin, it's 120 bucks. But what you can do is that you can everyone can be on one account together and you can then put your work collaboratively and add more data to the system. And so, so your admins or admin coordinators or whoever's evaluating teachers is, are also using them. So one school is doing it for the, you know, more of the evaluation piece. Um, the other schools have been given the option, so they're considering whether to do that. But we're doing this, though, for building capacity for the consortium. Do you, have you looked at Power BI? Power BI? Power. Uh, Microsoft product. That so same, but I think it's the same idea. Visualization, visualization tool. We pull data from wherever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, is it kind of like Tableau? I don't know. I, uh, I don't know. I have used Tableau. Okay. And I don't really use Power BI. We have somebody that does it for us, but he pulls all our data together and then presents it however we Yeah, want. you could do it. You could very much, you could have it on all this on a spreadsheet and have them do it that way as well. Um, yeah. yeah it just really depends. Um, and then what we do, um, you know, we 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 have we can easily have like I, I send quarterly, semesterly, and yearly data reports to all of our administrators yeah. based on where we're at. So I send them an email every quarter and they can review it. And um we want to focus on the growth of teachers in relation to the rubric because that's associated with their goals, and then align the data with the yearly professional development plan. So like our three-year plan or um the schools under um, a loss of accreditation or um, that type of thing. So, and which consortium do you get? Education and Career Network of North San Diego County. Oh, yours. Or yours? Oh, no, no, that's Howie. That's Howie. That's so, Howie, yeah. yeah. And what is that? Do you work in both college and K 12 adult schools? So, but we're not really focused on much of Palomar College. We haven't gotten too much on to their campus. Yeah, I guess that's that, not right. Yeah, I'm not. Well, it's because of some, I won't say the yeah. recording, but you know why. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. Okay. So before we go, um, I want you to jot down on the piece of paper here. Um, you know, keep this in mind. I used to think versus now, I think. So right, Keith? Uh, write down some key themes and ideas. And do you have any questions? Write down any uh, questions that you have. And then, um, you know, then what's the what's your next to do list? Are you going to look up some more information about this? Do you want to look at some research? Do you want to talk more about it? So go ahead and jot that down right now. And for that, um, and then for I think um, whoever's online right now, um, you can jot that down in the chat if you want, or you just can jot down a piece of paper. So just some three key themes and ideas, two questions or wonderings that you have, and then one extension with this thought that what did you used to think about this? And then now what do you think about this? So go ahead and spend some time. All right, does anyone have any thoughts or um, what were some of your main takeaways from this? And do you have any questions? I have a question. Yes. <clears throat> Can you give me a specific example of an area that you identified in a teacher's um, when you observed in a classroom and you said, okay, this is something that could be improved? Mm -hmm. And then what was the improvement you suggested? And then how was and how did that impact student outcome and student experience? Yeah, so for example, this happens all the time. So say that there's a teacher that's providing so much direct instruction where they're talking so much throughout the class and the students are not doing too much, right? They're just passively listening, right? So I've gone in and I've observed and you know looked at their lecture, looked at the slides, et cetera, and I talked a little bit about did you? I asked certain questions. Do you consider, you know, when your students are listening, are they not doing anything on their notes? Is there doing anything interactive? I use that type of language. I say, like, are you considering this? I go with like a question, and then at the end of my observation, like, here's some ideas to start considering, because then you may have students be a little bit more engaged, more have thought, you know, more discussion. I could provide a short little strategy, like. 
maybe um, I would like you to you know consider using more think pair share after you provide a little bit of um, direct instruction, have your students do a short little pair share and bring it back to the class, right? Something simple that can change. Then if we're thinking about tech, maybe you want them to have a little bit of an uh, interactive Google slideshow where the students are actually writing down their notes on a Google slide or describing their thinking. And then that can lead to more, you know, pair share and conversation. And then you as a teacher can see what your students are thinking in real time, and then you can monitor and adjust what you're trying to do. So those are just some basic things that we talk about, or it can be even simple, something like Canvas. Um, does your is your Canvas friendly to, um, you know, does it provide a video to help front load content? Does it have a slideshow? Are you collect are you conducting any assessment on your Canvas course? So those are just some of the questions that I sometimes start off with, I just usually just one, but then I provide a lot of like positive reinforcement. I do like four or five positive reinforcements followed by a couple of questions. And then that leads to the conversation, right? And then it's just a matter of showing up all the time <laughs> and taking interest and then building that relationship. And then that ultimately will have them be more motivated to want to engage with you and have conversation. And then work in a coaching sense or go to professional development or both. And then you start seeing, you know, over time, you start seeing those outcomes, you know, in terms of what their class looks like. If you go enough, you can see over time those, you know, different things that they're trying. Maybe they have more confidence or maybe that they want to try some new stuff. And then you cater to kind of like, how are they best going to learn? What does this person's schedule look like? You know, I can give them a bunch of templates or I can give them, you know, watch this video online or come to the professional development, right? So you try to meet them where they're at and give them, you know, options and choice as well as, you know, you're supporting them in what you feel like that they may want to improve in. And they may be a lot of conversations like, oh yeah, maybe I do talk too much or maybe I need to make this more interactive. Or maybe I need to try and learn how to use this tool, this strategy. A lot of times after a couple conversations, you're like, oh yeah, I, I think I agree with you. And sometimes you're going to run into conversations with people where they, they're not going to want to change. I mean, but then you maybe try and focus on things on the fringe, right? So that's kind of ultimately kind of my philosophy and how I've done it over the past couple of years. And I think, you know, if you can get hit about 80% of the teachers that, you know, are, you know, wanting to be coached, then you're going to have that organizational change versus, you know, you can't hit everyone. It's going to be impossible, right? But hopefully, like I mentioned earlier, the trickle down effect, right? When you get the adopters, you can get people that are excited about it, then it can change to, uh, you know, departmental change, right? So we just, for example, at one school, EL Civics, we we're focusing on UDL. And we wanted to incorporate on Canvas a page for um, digital literacy page where they would first watch a number of videos related to skills like Google Docs, slideshows, et cetera. And then after they reviewed the initial content, then they would be asked to complete a number of tasks and the students were given a choice on how they wanted to demonstrate their learning. So they could write, they could write the steps of how to use this tool. They could record themselves talking about the steps using this tool, or they could do something of both. They could write a number of steps, but they could also talk about, you know, how they're doing it. How are they using that particular tool, right? To help them with their digital literacy. So. That's just one example. And the team was very enthusiastic over time. It took a year to get them really enthusiastic, but now they're like, oh, I can see all this is really benefiting the students. This is benefiting us. And also too, like on Canvas, you can collaborate. So they're building out pages and they're um, dividing the labor. So they don't have to do as much, right? So. I think when you're focusing on those pieces, um, it really does help. I mean, it's, you know, it's not going to be perfect, but I think persistence and consistency will 
is, is the key for this. So if you have any questions, please feel free to reach out. Hope to connect on social media. Um, you can check out my blog. I do have a podcast. So if you want to learn more, 